Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. and I'm here to introduce and welcome Dr. Gary Small, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Dr. Small is one of the world's leading experts on brain science. Among his numerous breakthrough research studies, he now leads a team of neuroscientists who are demonstrating that simple exposure to computer technology causes rapid and profound changes in brain neural circuitry. He is here today to talk about how our frequent use of technology has not only altered our lives, it's altered our brains. For example, his brain research proves how we can indeed be addicted to our email, as we all know, because our dopamine levels are raised when we see messages that we like. Dr. Small is a professor of psychiatry and the director of UCLA's Memory and Aging Research Center. Scientific American Magazine named him one of the world's top innovators in science and technology. Dr. Small has invented the first brain scan that allows doctors to see the physical evidence of brain aging and Alzheimer's disease in living people. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Small to Microsoft to discuss his new book, iBrain. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's really great to be here and see so many of you come to hear what I have to talk about. But I, I heard the chuckles about the addiction to email, and, and I'm sure you all have a friend. It's, uh, nobody in this room is having those experiences. Well, th you know, this is a topic I, I find very interesting, in part because of my own research in brain science, but also because of my own experience as uh, what I'll call a digital immigrant and living with a couple of digital natives in their teen years. So I've kind of brought in some of my personal research experience at home as well as what we're doing at UCLA. So I want to make a couple of points. Uh, the first one you've already heard that technology is not just changing our lives, it's changing our brains. And that young people have the brains that are the most sensitive to this change and they're the most exposed. And so we have the digital natives who grow up with this technology 24-7, and then the older generation of digital immigrants. And I think what's happened, instead of the traditional generation gap, we have a brain gap because of the differences in brain neurocircuitry. And the purpose of iBrain and this whole discussion is to try to upgrade the tech skills of the immigrants and help the younger people with face-to-face -face communication skills so we can bridge that brain gap. Now, this is a big topic. We have technology all over the world. I don't have to tell you that. You live it here at Microsoft. But it's also personal. Okay? So I'd like to just do, without getting informed consent, I'd like to do a little experiment with you. Now, hopefully your cell phones are off. Are they off? Yeah. They may or may, if they're off or not, turn, I want you to turn them on. Okay? Just take a moment and turn on your PDAs. And how do you feel? Just think for a moment, how do you feel? You probably feel good. You're connected, right? Now, you don't have to do this if it makes you too anxious. I want you to swap your phone with a neighbor, preferably someone you don't know, okay? Just, get, just hand that little baby over to somebody nearby. And how do you feel? You probably, a little sense of panic, right? You, you know, are they going to drop it? I just got this new touchscreen device. It's so groovy and so forth. Now, take your phone back and calm down, okay? I can see the anxiety levels. I'm also a psychiatrist, by the way, so if anybody has a panic attack, you're in good hands. You can turn it off, and now you probably feel a little calmer. Okay, so you can see how it really affects our emotional state. I know the first, I'm, I'm a digital immigrant. I don't text message, I email. And, the, and my daughter taught me how to text message. And it, you know, I, I kind of feel good when I get her text messages. I feel very connected to her. So now, we know that our brains are changing from moment to moment. Every sensory stimulation causes a corresponding chemical reaction in the brain, whether you look at a computer screen, you look at a book, hopefully this book, or you look at somebody's facial expression. There are different neural circuits that are triggered. So light comes into your iris, goes to the retina, then there are complex neurotransmitters that are communicating the information from cell to cell along these neural networks, and the basic building block is the neuron. You have your 
cell body, which kind of controls a neuron, and then there's long wires or axons that communicate the informa information to the next cell, and there's a synapse, a little gap point, where the neurotransmitter or brain message is transmitted. So with these building blocks, we are able to experience lots of different experiences in life. There are specific regions that help us monitor falling in love or flossing our teeth. Any kind of, anything that's responsible for memory, feeling, sensation, goes through these neural circuits. And there are different brain regions that specialize. And we can label them. You've probably seen pictures of the brain like this, where you have, for example, this part of the brain control, the Broca's area controls language. Frontal lobe is complex reasoning. The visual cortex in the back of the brain controls vision and so forth. The whole thing only weighs three pounds, but it's extremely complex. There are a million times one billion of these synapses or communication sites. And it's so specialized that if we have somebody hear a word versus see a word or speak a word or generate a word, completely different neural circuits will be triggered. So you perceive an image or sensation. You, it can stir an emotion. It can jog or repress memory. It can trigger an autom automatic response, a motor response. And these processes are quite complex. You can actually image these various neural circuits. And we can measure what's going on in the brain in many different ways. We can actually look at the tissues you see here. We can follow the firing of these neurotransmitters. We can use PET scanning or functional MRI scanning to actually see these thoughts and feelings from moment to moment in the brain. And what we're finding is that the brain is quite plastic. It's quite malleable. And the young brain is the most malleable. It's like a computer in a sense. We have basic programs that are built in. There's plenty of room on the hard drive for new information. And we have specialized circuits or computer macros or similar to those. And what we find is that if we repeat a mental task over and over again, in a sense, those neural circuits for that task are strengthened. And if we neglect other tasks, those neural circuits, in a sense, weaken. Now, the young brain, which is quite malleable, uh, it learns very fast. A young person learns a language or a musical instrument very fast. But the downside of a young brain is it's not fully developed. The frontal lobe, which com controls complex reasoning, is not quite in place. And I can uh, tell you about that because I just taught my teenage daughter to drive. It took six months. I had jet black hair before I started. So it's a, <laughs> the teenage brain is not ready for that complex reasoning, thinking forward, putting together the big picture. Also, the amygdala and empathic skills are not quite fully developed in a teenager. There's also this process of pruning. 60% of those synaptic connections are pruned away in the development of the brain. So a lot of the neural circuitry we never use. And so it brings up issues about brain evolution. And we know that as uh, man evolved, the size of the brain increased from lower species. And there have been major milestones in brain evolution. Uh, a very important one was the development of the handheld tool. Many years ago, there was a discovery that you could take a rock and carve it into a tool, and that led to handedness. It led, led to enlargement of the frontal lobe, grammatical language, more complex social networks. And the question is today, what will happen with these new handheld tools? How will our brain evolve? And it brings up issues of natural selection that Darwin introduced. The basic idea that genetic variants that adapt best to the environment are most likely to survive. So why do we have giraffes? Because there wasn't a lot of foliage in the, in the floor of the desert. And so the animal, the next generation, that had the longest neck survived. And different species survive because they adapt to their environment. Question is, what will the brain look like adapting from this environment to this new environment? And what I argue in iBrain is that we're going to have some adaptation. This, by the way, looks like a little bit like my daughter's room, which we call the cockpit because of all her different technologies that she's working on at once. So we have uh, evolution demonstrated here. And then what will the new man look like? We don't know. But here's a question for you. 
is the environment really changing? Young people between ages 8 and 18 put in a total of how much screen time, that is, not just screen time, but technology time, computer, TV, et cetera, each day. How many of you think two hours? Three, three and a half hours. Okay. Yeah, I, I would rephrase the question. Any kind of technology time, cell phone, iPod, anything. How about five and a half hours? Okay. Seven hours. Okay, we have a few more hands. Eight and a half? Eight and a half is right. Nearly nine hours a day with technology time. So that's a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 35 years ago. 35 years ago, you didn't have that kind of technology time. You watched a half hour of television before you, after your homework at night, right? No. And your grandmother told you it would rot your brain. No, I like five or six hours of television a day easily. Well, it's, you know, it's changing. And I think, you know, the, the, some of the issues, and we'll get to that in a moment, how this might have a negative effect, how it might have a positive effect. One negative effect is that with all that time in front of the screen, people are not spending time away from the screen. They're not spending time in face-to-face -face conversations. And these digital natives, I think, are not developing those em empathy skills that they might develop if they were having conversations, looking into people's eyes. How many times a day, how many people here are define themselves as digital natives? Anybody? Okay. So let's be honest. How many times a day do you check your Facebook or MySpace? Uh, way, more than 10. way more than 10. Okay, we have an honest person. <laughs> Very good. So this is just part, this is part of your life, and that's a positive thing. You're constantly connected socially, but what is the down part? What about New York Times has an article, Slow Down, Brave Multitasker, and Don't Read This in Traffic. Generation text, emailing on the go. Here's one person telling you how you can walk and text at the same time without injuring yourself. You keep your chin at about a 45 degree angle. Another problem that we're facing is technology and addiction. And we know there are pathways in the brain, the dopamine pathways that are involved in the whole reward system in the brain, and they control any kind of addictive tendency, whether it's alcohol, drugs, food, or technology. And the frontal lobe, anterior cingulate circuits, try to control that. So it can be shopping, it can be gambling, or it can be virtual games. There's a virtual, how many of you heard of Second Life? That virtual game, so you know about it. There are people who play Second Life 12 to 14 hours a day. They've got to be neglecting their real life with their avatars. Now, how does technology and addiction work? You can think about it in terms of email. There's a principle in psychology called operant conditioning. And it's a basic idea that any behavior is reinforced by the consequence of that behavior. So if you're if this sad face represents an email message. This might be the first email you open, and then the next one, and the next one. After a while, you'll give up on it until you get one of these. And that feels pretty good. You know, you just, somebody finally responded to your request, or a friend is coming into town, and that's great. And because of that one happy face, you keep searching and searching, and you keep going back for all your emails. And in fact, that kind of pattern of operant conditioning is a much stronger reinforcer than if every email was uh, winning the lottery. This idea that the, the technology time may be having a negative effect on the face-to-face -face time was held up by a recent study where the investigators looked at about 200 young people ages 17 to 23 years and they had the people in this study play video games and then watched a series of calm faces turn or morph into either a happy face or an angry face. So this was the experiment. The face might look like this, and then at a certain point it gets angry. This is a bad day at Microsoft, or it might turn happy. And what they found was <clears throat> there was certainly a happy face advantage. Most of the volunteers could recognize a happy face faster, but when they played a violent video game, they lost that happy face advantage, suggesting that the neural circuits for reading nonverbal communication and emotional expressions might be impaired. There's another big literature, scientific literature, on technology and attention deficit. There have been many studies that have found an association between ADHD and technology time, particularly watching TV and videos. And in fact, 
it's been such a strong association that the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommend, recommended no TV and video for kids under two years of age. Now, that's a bit controversial. It hasn't been demonstrated definitely as a cause and effect relationship. You had a question on that? On the previous slide, you said that there's also a direct correlation on uh, GPA, positive or negative. In this, in this particular study, it was negative. That the more technology time, the lower the GPA. And there have been many other studies like that. But I want to say it is controversial because some would argue that somebody who has a predisposition to attention deficit may be drawn to the technology. But enough parents and pediatricians have been concerned about it that they try to limit the tech time in these young people. And then we have the text generation. Are you too old or are you? So uh, who, what does this mean? Laugh out loud, very good. I thought this meant good morning America, but I've been doing too much media. It's great minds think alike. Get a life. Parents are watching. <laughs> How many of you have teenagers? Okay, now you know. So you, got, you, you, you learned something today. <laughs> and I love you. And, and then there's emoticons. This, if you have to tilt your head, we all know emoticons, the happy face. But I thought some of these are fun. This is the startled face. This one is, see if you can figure this one out. This is Elvis Presley. <laughs> and how about this? This is John Lennon. So you can have a lot of fun with this. And actually, when we look at brain scans of people who are looking at a book page, or looking at an emoticon, completely different parts of the brain are activated from these different stimuli. Reading time is on the, on the decline as, uh, as we have more tech time. The more time we spend with the technology, the less time we spend outdoors or in sports. Uh, there was a recent study that found that more time in front of the computer and television, less time participating in physical activities. And now we have what we might call the fractured family. You have the kids reading on their computers and the parents reading the newspaper and the books. And we have the digital immigrants who come to technology later in life. We're more reluctant to take on a new technology. I tend to, to get a new device and I want to upgrade it rather than get a new one right away. It's a very different culture. And we also have older brains. Uh, and one of the downsides of an older brain, it tends to be more forgetful. Our reaction time is slower. We're not as good at multitasking. And so it's a little bit harder for us to adapt to the new technology. And we can remember, I mean, you know, to me, this was new technology. The first time I watched color television. The IBM Selectric typewriter with that fantastic er eraser er tape. And then, of course, uh, we used to dial numbers on the phone, although we still talk about dialing a phone number. Remember those first mobile phones? Those are great. You get tennis elbow, and the first computer game, Pong, and of course Betamax. I don't know how many people, any of you remember Betamax? Yeah. That was the format that was going to take over. Not. <laughs> now, we know that as we get older, we're less likely to use this technology. There have been a number of studies showing that, and, and you see that in this study here, where the penetration is almost 100% in young people, and by age 75, it's much lower. And if we look at some of the brain scanning technologies, we can see how the brain changes with age. And it really is not functioning as well. Older people have memory disturbances. So it can be a challenge to deal with the technologies. Now, the digital immigrants here, how many times a day do you check your email? How many do it once a day? Okay, three, three to five times a day. How many of you are checking it right now? <laughs> okay, very good. So it's there. So that tends to be our mainstay of communication. And we're constantly bombarded by the email and other information. And so we're multitasking using different parts of our brain. And it's not a terribly efficient way to go. And many people complain of digital fog, that they can't keep anything straight. And with the memory decline in middle age, it becomes a real challenge. So at UCLA, we wanted to understand this better. And we wanted to find out what happens to the brain when it searches on the internet. And I was really struck 
by wanting to do this study when I researched iBrain because no one had done it. No one, you think there'd be, that they've looked at every kind of mental process in the brain, but no one asked this question. So to, to do this study, I got the help of a couple of neuropsychologists, Tina Moody and Susan Buchheimer, who have a lot of expertise with functional MRI. We got some money from the Parvin Foundation, and this study is now in press in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. So we wanted to recruit middle-aged and older people who had minimal internet experience, and that was hard to do. Congratulations, you're the last person on earth to get an email account. We, uh, we did not use the internet to recruit them, uh, but they were out there, we found them, and we matched up this internet naive or net naive group to a group of net savvy individuals. And we wanted to determine what's happening in the brain, how are the neural circuits changing when they're searching online. And here's the study subjects. If you're familiar with looking at these kinds of tables, uh, they were on average in their mid to early 60s, a few years of college, mostly female. And really the only way these groups differed was in terms of their prior computer use, frequency of internet use, and their self-rating of internet experience. So to do this study, we used this uh, technology called functional MRI. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it takes a conventional MRI scanner and it changes the device in a way so that we can actually see blood flow to the brain from moment to moment and we can present people with mental tasks. Now it's a very narrow tube, so you cannot get a computer in the tube. And so we use these specialized goggles and we show people different images. This was a control task to control for attention. This was a a book page task. We wanted to control for what it was like to look at a book page and get information that way. Here was a, an internet task and they had to control the cursor with a little touch pad at their side to decide where they should search for the information and this was another information page. And we found a very interesting result when we put it all together. If you look at the net naive people reading the textbook this is where their brain was activated in the visual cortex and areas controlling language. When you looked at them searching online, it was a very similar pattern. The net savvy people had a very similar pattern of activation, but what was very dramatic is when the people with prior internet experience searched online. There was more than a two-fold greater extent of activation, particularly in the front part of the brain that controls complex reasoning. So here's reading a book, Here's searching on Google. So what we found was this dramatic difference between the groups. And it really raises some very interesting questions. One is, is it possible that just searching online is a good mental activity? Yeah, you have a question? Is it possible that your sample book was boring? Is, is it, it possible that the sample book was boring? Um, I don't think so because we chose topics that were of interest for the age group. It wasn't something like find a good uh, skateboard park, you know, in uh, West Seattle. It was, you know, what are the benefits of eating chocolate or eating fish? And we gave them a test for the content afterwards. So they were motivated to get the information. And we actually matched the content be very carefully between the internet task and the book page task. But that's a good question. The other thing we did was we had a follow-up study. We asked the question, what would happen if people began to train their brains. If we took the net naive people and asked them to search online every day for an hour, and after just less than a week, we saw that the, at the second session, the net savvy people, whoops, looked the same, but the net naive people started looking like the net savvy people, the frontal lobe circuits starting to engage. So very rapidly, we could teach an old brain new technology tricks. Now, if you look at the, there have been a few studies looking at, say, video gaming and brain activation. You find mixed results. Some of the games cause increased activity in the frontal lobe, some cause decreased activity. And I think the issue is the content of the material, the novelty of the task, and the duration of the task. And, and, and the way I understand what happens is, is shown here. If we plot brain activity versus time, Initially, when we're presented with a new mental task, we don't quite get it, and our brain circuits don't activate, so you see very little activity. Once we work out a strategy 
Then there's increased engage engagement of these, act of these neural circuits, as we saw in the Brain on Google study. And once we get really good at it, and it's no longer novel, we develop brain efficiency. And we've shown this when we teach people memory techniques. We see better memory performance and less brain activity on the scan. So there's a whole uh, world out there of brain fitness trying to develop devices to show us how to improve our memory and improve our brain circuitry. And even at UCLA, we even have a one-day brain boot camp where people can come in and jumpstart their memory performance. And we've got memory training programs across the country in about seven states. But some people are asking, is technology weakening our memory? How many phone numbers do you know by heart? Probably not that many, or not <laughs> one. <laughs> That's one phone number. And you know what's happening, we use our devices to remember all this information. Does relying on your PDA shrink your hippocampus? Uh, now where did I leave my brain, let alone trying to find where your PDA is? You know, I think it's probably not harming our memory in that sense. In fact, we can pick and choose what we decide to commit to our biological memory and what we want to uh, use our devices for. So names and faces, that's important for our real brain memory. Birth dates and other types of uh, details we can put in our PDAs. Yeah? Phone numbers, now I have to remember all my web passwords. You have to remember all your web passes. Yeah, that's a real challenge. So. What about the upside of technology? And I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of technology. Surgeons who play video games make fewer errors in the operating room. So the next time you decide to have elective surgery, find out if the surgeon is playing World at War. You may have a better outcome. Uh, we know that the, the gaming experience and some of these technologies will improve visual attention, peripheral vision, and reaction time. Uh, there's also a place for offline training. We know that psychotherapy or talking to people can activate different neural circuits. Particularly here you see the amygdala, which is an emotional circuit in the brain. Or here we did the, the uh, healthy lifestyle study a few years ago. We found the prefrontal cortex increased in efficiency from relaxation exercises, physical exercise, and mental training. So what our purpose here, I think what we should be thinking about in having this discussion is a way of bridging the brain gap between the natives and the immigrants, upgrading the tech skills of the immigrants, helping the younger people with their social skills, and trying to innovate with technology. I know that Microsoft is a, a wonderful place for innovation. Uh, you know, here, I guess this is the Wii Fit uh, that is probably a great way to learn balance training and could probably be uh, combined with memory exercises. We've got to think about taking time offline, talking with other people, spending time away from the technology. Uh, a lot of families do better if they turn off the technology at dinner time. Studies have found that teenagers who have a regular family dinner uh, get less involved with risk-taking behavior. Another thing to think about is just uh, turning it off at a certain time at night. So we want to manage the technology to preserve our humanity. So I just wanted, before I close, because I want to uh, give you a chance to ask any questions if you have them, I wanted to talk, speculate for a moment about the future brain. And there's a lot of work right now on brain uh, computer interface technology. And in fact, uh, there are these sensors where people can operate a cursor just by thinking about it. And uh, there's lots of interesting experiments going on right now. And uh, this may be the uh, school student, uh, the, the student of the future, wearing these headgears. And what's quite interesting is uh, the first technology to, to be introduced to the public, I think, if we believe the ads about it, will be a company that developed this technology for a video game. So you can actually control your video game just with your thoughts. But I think uh, what, what we'll see in the future, people will probably, instead of having a Bluetooth, they'll have a little device uh, next to their scalp where they can think of something that will be transmitted to their laptop or their PDA, which will go Wi-Fi to their friend. So if you want to meet your friend for coffee, you just think about it. Now the downside is you'll have to wear tinfoil on your head so people won't read your minds. So in conclusion, I hope 
you are convinced that technology is not just changing our lives, but it's actually having an effect on our brains. We have a new generation gap, what I call the brain gap. And I think we can find balance in our lives and bridge this brain gap and improve our, both our technology and our social skills and know when the best time it is to use each of them. If you want some more information, drgarysmall.com, drgarysmall.com. Thank you very much for your attention. And also thank you if you were checking your email during my talk. It didn't distract me too much. <laughs>So I have a middle-aged brain, I have to watch out for my multitasking, yes. Um, is there any uh, research that you've done on the durability of the changes or whether or not they reverse if you remove the digital media from a person's life? So we haven't looked at the durability issue. We've just, this, this area of research I think is in its infancy. You have some studies looking at behavior and technology, but not a lot looking at actual brain changes that might occur with technology. And just my own experience as a, as a neuroscientist and psychiatrist, uh, the, the good thing is that our brains are plastic at any age. So if we do have a negative effect, there's an opportunity to bring us back. And you know, examples of experiments that have been done showing you this changeability, I mean, you can take volunteers and you can teach them to juggle. And they juggle for a while. The right side of the brain actually gets bigger which is the visual spatial hemisphere of the brain. When they stop juggling, their brains shrink back down. So we can uh, get a fat head or a, a skinny head, uh, depending on what our activity level is. Yeah. So uh, is there any study around uh, like the level of skepticism we have towards information with the increase of technology? Because there was a time when you know, things were much more trustable. Uh, just because there was a very small amount of, uh, you know, small, few but reliable sources, yeah. and now that there's so much of information flowing in, uh, is any of this like related to that? Uh, well, it is related, and there there is not much direct study of the skepticism, but this is a real phenomenon, and in iBrain, uh, we have a whole chapter where we look at how it's altering our culture, and we have a new culture where there there are no editors. The users are defining the world with Wikipedia. I mean, we, we make it up as we go along. Uh, everybody's got a blog, everybody has an opinion, and there's not this vetting process. And there is a level of skepticism. It's interesting because uh, during the course of launching this book, I'll be talking to a number of schools. And uh, I notice that you, know, you go into the schools today, they teach the kids how do you determine whether information on the internet is reliable, is trustworthy. What sort of things do we do? You know, I think on the, on the positive side, if you're an intelligent thinking individual, you work out a way to uh, vet the information. And I think that's probably a process that goes on when we're just searching online. That decision-making process, that interactive process of thinking, should I go to this website or that website to, to get the information I need it's all going on in our minds at a very rapid rate. Sorry, just oh, to follow up on yeah. that. Uh, I think that even the addiction to technology is driven by the skepticism that's increased <coughs> to some degree because you're constantly trying to get validation for the things you believe in based on all the information you've got. And you know, you're, you're, that's why you're always waiting to make sure that you know, your assumptions about the world are right. And that drives the addiction to frequently check you know, email and other sources to make sure that you're... Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, you could see it as driven by uh, skepticism. Uh, I tend to see the, the cup half full. I would say it's driven by our natural curiosity to find out more. And it's very easy to get carried away. It happened to me the other day. Uh, my wife, Gigi, asked me a question, and I didn't have my computer open, and I kind of just went to my PDA, and I started searching for the question. Then I got distracted. I just went on a whole different tangent. And I was you know, going on and on. And I realized 20 minutes had gone by, and I forgot the other task. So. Yeah? Is there any um, theory on whether that overstimulation of the brain is ultimately a good thing or a bad thing? Do, do we have any comparisons with other activities? <coughs> with, the, with the video and the internet, the activation was a lot more spread. Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of overstimulation, have, there have been some, some things written about television addiction and how, you know, we think we're watching television to become stimulated, but really when you look at people, they become 
uh, less stimulated. They, they, their minds become dulled and they're less attentive. And so we know that about television to some extent. Uh, not so much so about the video games and doing internet or email activities over a period of time. I talk about this concept of partial continuous attention that we all get into. I mean, we have, uh, it's just remarkable that we can sit at our desks and we have you know, the email coming in, you might have instant messaging, you might be getting texts, you may be getting phones, landlines, whatever those are, that's kind of old school, or on your uh, cell phone. And so you're, you're always, at a, you're waiting for that next bit of information, that next happy face that will come in. And I would suggest that that is a stressful state. Uh, it takes up a lot of neural activity, and it may not be good for our brains, and we know when our brains are under prolonged stress, that our bodies will secrete cortisol, stress hormone that is great for an acute situation to react and respond and protect ourselves. But under chronic conditions, uh, animal studies have actually found that cortisol will shrink the hippocampal memory centers of the brain. And human volunteers injected with cortisol have impairment in learning and recall. So I think, you know, I think we ha what we have to do, we may not have all the answers, but we have to pay attention to how we're feeling and what we're experiencing. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a big topic. It's a worldwide topic, but it's also very personal. And you could see just that little experiment we did in the beginning, it caused an emotional reaction. And, I, and what I'm asking people to do is take note of how they're feeling with their technology and try to take control of it. Yeah. I have a little question. Uh, um, what is the science behind a recommendation to not expose children under two years to uh, technology, TV? Well, I, I think that stemmed from several studies, observational studies, showing an association between television watching primarily and symptoms of attention deficit in children. And so there was a concern that it might be a cause and effect relationship. Now, there's been other studies. There was another study, a controversial study that I talk about in iBrain. Uh, there was an economist who had a, a young child with the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And he noticed when he pulled his kid away from the television, his, the, the child's symptoms improved. And in fact, for that condition, what's often recommended is early intervention and uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. You really spend a lot of time with face-to-face -face communication with the kids, and that helps tremendously. Well, to try to understand a possible connection, he did a study, and it actually involved Washington. He looked at the precipitation rates, or rainfall uh, rates, in Washington, California, and Oregon, three states that have a lot of variability in precipitation. And he found a very strong correlation between autism incidence and precipitation from year to year. And so the thinking was, when there's more rainfall, the kids are spending more time indoors exposed to the technology. And as a, a secondary measure, he looked at the rates of, of um, uh, <clears throat> subscription to cable television, and he found a similar correlation. So that's controversial also because it doesn't absolutely prove the cause and effect, but it's certainly something to take note of and think about. Yeah? Conventional wisdom is that when kids play video game too long, the eyesight gets, you know, uh, destroy somehow. Also, you know, the kids will get spasm on the head. So, do you, and, but there are some other reports that I read that when they play Wii, then it, it improve the eye head, you know, coordination. Mm -hmm. That therefore uh, improving their eyesight. So, do you, what's the definitive study on this? Well, if I had the definitive study, you know, I probably wouldn't be talking here today. I'd be, <laughs> I would be defining it somewhere in virtual space. Uh, you know, I think it's complex. Uh, the brain is complex and technology is complex. So I think it depends on the content of the game, how long they're playing it, what the activity is. So for example, uh, there are now lots of computer programs that help older people improve their memory. I just saw recently uh, a company has a program that helps with peripheral vision and Allstate Insurance Company is making that available to older drivers, hoping it will improve their driving skills. So we can, I mean, the, the technology is amazing. I'm talking about, right now, the kinds of games we have, the violent games, 
it seems to have a negative effect on face-to-face uh, -face communication skills. On the other hand, there are new programs that may help people recognize nonverbal communication. You know, with a virtual world, you can make it seem very real, and you can teach people subtle communication tips. So I, you know, I don't think there is anything definitive, and I think as a result of that, as parents, as users, whatever we may be, uh, we want to keep it in mind. We want to try to take breaks, not do an email marathon for three hours at a time, but to get up, stretch, make sure you don't get eye strain or, or neck pump. Well, that and older people, you know, using the buttons uh, on the small devices is very difficult because of arthritis. Yeah. Did you do any um, evaluation of correlation between the kinds of video games and the other entertainment forms on a consistent basis? So, for example, violent games against violent films against uh, uh, books of the same nature to see if it was entertainment related uh, and, and correlations along those lines? We didn't do those studies. There, there is a literature. Most of the literature on video gaming focuses on violent games and its connection with aggressive behavior in kids. And generally there's a correlation and what they tend to find is, you know, the intensity of the experience tends to show a higher correlation, which, which tends to make sense. But you know, it raises some interesting questions about these virtual worlds and these games and with young people not spending time reading and their minds rewiring in different ways. What's going to happen in the future? Will we actually have novels that people will read, or will there be elaborate virtual video games with narrative in them? Will that be the new form of a novel that a tradi trying to imagine yourself in the character's place, that's old school. I want to be in there. I want to be part of the experience. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, big, big question here. Uh, so you talked about memory using technology to help, uh, you know, effects on memory and being able to recognize faces, for instance. So most of the people polled all across the world, the thing that everybody wants is happiness and a feeling of well-being. You know, kind of cuts across all cultures and it's really relevant to a lot of di all the different product groups, pretty much in Microsoft. You know, so are you? So uh, I'm just kind of curious uh, for you. I just, um, I'd like you to talk about technology, any role in technology and overall positive psychology and happiness and well-being. Are there any studies on, on, on in this area? Well, yeah, I think that you know the whole happiness uh, scientific realm, if, if there is such a thing, uh, really has not focused on the new technology as much. You know, where the closest thing I can think of uh, addressing it might be where we're going with addiction, because what is, the, what is behind those addictive tendencies? It's people searching out that good feeling. They want that dopamine circuit to fire so they can get the happy face. You know, the eBay shopping bid, so they, they get what they want. The gambling, whatever it may be, the virtual worlds. They're searching for that happiness. What I'm trying to suggest to people is that that's not the way to go. To, to get happy, to, to feel contentment in our lives, we need balance. And in fact, the, the future brain I would like to see is one that has mastered the face-to-face -face human contact skills as well as the technology skills and, and knows when to use each. Uh, you know, we need to know when the, the best email response is, let's talk. I don't know. I mean, I didn't have, I don't, unfortunately, I don't, I, as far as I know, that field of happiness and technology, it's, it's really in its infancy. So there's no uh, way to prove that uh, how technology can make us happier? Well, it depends on your measure of happiness. I mean, what, what, uh, how are you well, going to... Uh, positive psychology usually is done over the internet, that, like just poll people. How, yeah. uh, how do you feel at this point during the day? Well, I mean, you can, there are studies like that looking at satisfaction levels with different types of technology behaviors. So there is a literature on email use, and they find that people who tend to be more social phobic, who tend to be shyer, who have lower self-esteem, tend to prefer using the technology because it helps them manage some of those feelings. If you have a face-to-face -face conversation with someone, you've got to respond from moment to moment. You may alter your response depending on whether they look bored, they look interested. With email, you don't do that. You've got time to think about it. It's not as much pressure and it may make those people feel happier. We had a, another question here. Yeah. Um, comparing 
the, I guess, the digital natives to the digital immigrants, how do you think learning is going to change? Like, obviously, I know, like, in my peer group, people don't pick up a book. Maybe we talked a little bit about how people don't go to the library and check out books. Instead, my friends, if they wanted to know how to do something, would search it or go on YouTube. How do you think that's going to change the way people learn in the future? Well, I think it's changing right now. I think that that's, that's the new culture. It's, uh, it's, it's good and it's bad. I mean, the good part is you get that information so quickly. I mean, I think in my own life, when I started writing research articles uh, 25 years ago, I would go to the library, I'd get out the journals, uh, and I'd sneeze because there was a lot of dust. Now I can just get everything online. I just kind of uh, go to PubMed, and it's, it's right there, and that's a, a magnificent thing. But there's probably uh, a superficiality that results from this kind of instant information. You know, people may tend to read the abstracts very quickly online and not actually read the whole article. And the same is true uh, with any kind of information processing. So I think we sacrifice depth for perhaps breadth. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like a follow-up question to that. Like, because people are more reliant on like searching to find information as a sort of natural way rather than going deep and researching into things, then what do you think that means for science as a whole and innovation as a whole? Do you think that our, our brains are wired to stop thinking abstractly or stop thinking in terms of collective long-term memory and like it becomes this like, you know, fast food kind of sound bite kind of thinking and does that, do you think that there will be any impact, negative impact in terms of the ability to do things like research or like an abstract science yeah. and so on? Yeah, I, I just don't know. I think that, you know, that could be a problem. Uh, for some people. On the other hand, I think there's a tremendous benefit in terms of innovation because people who are not just like-minded, but people from all over the world can begin to have conversations and bounce back and forth new ideas. I'm, I found in, in my own work the, uh, the greatest discoveries have resulted from people getting together with different technical backgrounds. So having the chemists sit down with the psychologists and have a conversation about how do you solve this problem. And I think the technology allows us to do that much more effectively. Uh, but there is a concern, you know, you, you, can't, you can't have it all. If you want that much information, you've got to crystallize it to some extent. Now, one could argue that's a good thing. I was uh, helping my son the other day with his homework and he was struggling with summaries. You know, how do you do a summary? How do you pull out what's the important information and and that's an important task so what i would hope is that we don't lose that capacity uh yeah two, two more, more questions? questions okay yeah if you um, have an opinion or is there any research in uh, using the technology to to teach the brain um for some mental conditions like um depression since you know depression to, to reinforce the positive neural message because you can have a more controlled environment mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we haven't done that uh, in our group, but there are groups that are trying to develop those technologies, and you know, it's it's something that definitely could be done. You can you could probably and this would be very controversial, but you could train a computer to be like a psychotherapist to some extent, and uh, it's a little bit scary, but uh, you know, maybe maybe. <laughs> It certainly seems like a possibility to, to some extent. I'm almost thinking from a, almost like a, a video game where you could take a different Right, we create it, what you do is you create it as a game. And we're, and we're sort of doing it. I've worked with companies where they are trying to develop brain training technologies. And, and that's exactly what they do. They take the memory techniques we know work and they create a game out of it. Now let's play names and faces. And they make it fun. Uh, but it has an endpoint to improve the person's everyday memory skills. And you could certainly do that. Let's say somebody had um, agoraphobia or panic attacks, and, and the treatment there would be a cognitive behavioral approach where you uh, create a hierarchy of desensitization. So the computer could help you. Uh, you know, you could come up with a li I could just see it right now. In fact, um, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this because I, I should be talking to my patent attorney because it's actually a good idea where you would, you know, you'd have a higher, you ask questions, what, you know, what scares you more, 
heights, snakes, and so forth. And then it creates sort of a virtual world where it introduces, you know, you can kind of monitor your anxiety level and you introduce yourself to it very gradually. Damn, I wish I wouldn't have given away that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll advise you. <laughs> yeah. uh, first question. Like, in your presentation, uh, such as for your experiments of uh, MRI, functional MRI, you have an assumption that uh, different parts of the brain have different functions, right. corresponding functions. But uh, it seems not necessary so, because in some car injury or some injury, the brain parts die, but the other parts can take over this function. <laughs> Things brain cell are designed similar, uh, but why we are structured this way? Like left brain is good for creativity and uh, arts, and the right brain always for the routines. Well, you know these are big questions. I you know they're hard to get to, but you're absolutely right. The brain does have this plasticity. Where if there's a brain injury, uh, certain cells, for example, visual cells might, if somebody is blind, those the visual cortex might be used for hearing or other forms of sensation, so we can adapt. Those brain regions are general regions that study after study has found, uh, you know, from looking at epileptic patients or injured patients, where the brain circuits have been mapped out and, and fairly well defined. So I think with reasonable confidence we can say this is the visual cortex being stimulated and it makes sense. So, uh, Well, thank you very, this is a wonderful discussion. I appreciate your questions. <laughs>